Your Eminence, Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, it's a great honor and pleasure to be here today and to discuss uh, on religious freedom in Turkey. Religious freedom is a very important issue for Europe. We have believed in Western Europe that this issue is quite solved, but more recently it appears that uh, this problem is coming back quite strongly. It is important to discuss of religious freedom and the rights of the minorities in Turkey because Turkey is the only member state of the Council of Europe where in peacetime it is unfortunately not uncommon to see assaults and even assassinations motivated by religious hatred as it was witnessed recently with the murder of Monsignor Padovese, the personal representative of the Pope in Turkey. Anti-religious hatred or Christianophobia is quite frequent and widespread in the public opinion. Many people are questioning whether there is room in Turkey for religious liberty as it is torn between Islamism and secularism. These extreme approaches of the role of religion in society seems to be omnipresent in Turkey and to occupy all political space, to the point where moderation seems quite impossible. Because of the sociological and cultural specificity of Turkey, the European institutions have not always required the same standard of protection for the rights of minorities that is required in European countries. This low level of requirement from the West can be explained by different factors. The geopolitical, geopolitical importance of Turkey, the low number of non-Muslim minorities remaining in Turkey, and finally maybe the hidden belief that religious moderation might not be in the nature of the current Muslim culture. But more frequently, the European institutions have been increasingly attempting to promote religious moderation in Turkish politics. Only within the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, in addition to the numerous decisions of the European Court of Human Rights, the issue of monetary rights and religious freedom in Turkey has been addressed almost simultaneously by three different and excellent reports done by the Parliamentary Assembly, the Venice Commission, and the Commissioner for Human Rights of the Council of Europe. Also, recently, at the United Nations, this specific issue of the monetary rights has been addressed during the discussions before the Human Rights Council during the periodic review of the situation of human rights in Turkey. So, clearly, religious freedom in Turkey is a cause of concern for the international community, and it is very important to keep it on the European and international agenda. The discriminations and denial of rights endured by the religious minorities in Turkey are numerous. The first being the non-recognition of the legal personality of the communities. One of the main causes of those discriminations is the lack of a united legal regime for religion. Even within the Christian minority, each denomination does not enjoy necessarily the same rights. Some are recognized, others are not, even if they've been present on this soil since the Byzantine time, like the Syriacs. Some of those issues have been scrutinized by the European Court of Human Rights, such as the ones related to the property rights, and it is a case law of the Court of Strasbourg that has led to reform the law governing associations and foundations in order to provide the beginning of a legal framework for the church properties. However, the non-Muslim minorities of Turkey still not have a legal personality. The consequences of this are many and well known. Communities have had land and buildings for centuries cannot still be registered as their direct owners. This situation, justified in the name of the principle of secularism, has also a symbolic meaning. If one cannot legally own the land, 
he remains a foreigner. This is a way to keep the minorities in a condition of subjection. Refusing to address the ecumenical patriarch with his official title has, I think, the same purpose. We know the problems are many. Through the Court of Strasbourg and through the EU, if the Turkish government is reasonable, it should not be impossible to address those legal issues. My main concern is more about the, right, the widespread Christianophobia in the public opinion. The real problem is that too frequently people can get harassed or injured and even killed only because they are Christians. And so the real question is, what is really doing the government to stop this hatred? It seems that a government that endorses legal discriminations against the minorities cannot be fully trusted when it advocates for tolerance. In this respect, I must say that one of the best speeches I have ever heard advocating religious freedom was made by the representative of the Turkish government participating at the Alliance for Civilization. But sadly, those speech seems to be primarily for exportation to promote the right of the Turkish migrants living in Europe. As some recent incidents in Switzerland and Austria have shown, the Turkish government knows how to advocate very strongly in support of those minorities. So it would be nice if we could see the same willingness for the Turkish government in favor of its own religious minorities. Many promises have been made. Many reforms still need to be enacted and implemented. It is time for decision and for being sincere. Thank you. Uh, Your Eminence, Excellencies, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, our organization, Human Rights uh, Without Frontiers, started dealing with uh, Christians uh, in uh, Turkey in the early 90s uh, when the first waves of Syriac Orthodox and Chaldeans arrived in Western Europe as asylum seekers. They were then victims of the Turkish army and the Kurds. They left their villages and homes often destroyed in search of a better and more tolerant world where their security would be guaranteed, where their daughters would not be kidnapped to be forcibly married to a young Muslim, and where their crops would not be burned. The message that they also brought is that the Armenians were not the sole victims of the genocide perpetrated during the First World War. They also had been victims of that genocide that they called the SAFO. Of course, the genocide is far behind us, but we remain concerned about persistent anti-Christian feelings that still prevail in Turkey. The battle for fair laws and equality of religion is certainly a priority, but improving the legal framework regulating the life of religious communities, and in particular non-Muslim religious groups, is not sufficient to eradicate the problems of religious intolerance that they have been experiencing for years. According to some recent surveys, Turkish society does not demonstrate a tolerant or respectful attitude towards people of different religious uh, communities. An interesting study uh, conducted by Istanbul's Sabanci University in 2009 and named Religiosity in Turkey, an international study, reveals that of those who joined the study, 66% said that members of other religions should not be allowed to expound their ideas by organizing meetings open to the public. 62% said they should not be allowed to give out books that explain their views. The survey also found that almost 40% of the population of Turkey said they had very negative or negative views of Christians. Alixar Kruglu, one of the two professors uh, at the Sabanci University who conducted the study, said that no non-Muslim religious gathering in Turkey is completely risk-free. The report was part of a study commissioned by the International Social Survey Program, a 45-nation academic group 
that conducts polls and research about social and political issues. The survey quantified how religious the population in each of its 43 member countries were. This year marked the first time study data had been collected in Turkey, and Turkey was the only Muslim majority population in the study. While 42% of the population agreed with the statement that religious people should be tolerant, 49% of those surveyed said they, they would either absolutely or most likely not support a political party that accepted people from another religion. But 20% of those surveyed said that they had very positive or positive views of Christians, 13 very positive and 7% positive. Professor Charkoglu said the results of the study could be attributed to the Turkish educational system, which mandates religious studies for both junior high schools and high school students, classes in which Christians and Jews, and I quote, are not even mentioned or are portrayed as the others. That instills in these students a severe point of view, point of view of uh, intolerance. This study was just confirming an earlier survey carried out in 2005 by Pew Global Attitudes Project, which also suggested a distinctly negative attitude towards Christians among Turks, with 63% describing their views of Christians as unfavorable, the highest rate among the countries then surveyed. Such social attitudes can explain a number of hate crimes targeting or planned to target Christians and clerics in the last few years. But it's not only with laws that they can be fought against, but it's also through education of the public, children and youth in schools and in the media. As our time is limited, I will not expand more uh, on my paper, and I will give the floor to uh, Mr. Otmar Oering. Thank you for your attention. Let me first of all make a few remarks regarding the word minority. Um, I was quite astonished when I first heard that uh, this would be a conference on religious minorities in Turkey because, uh, let's say, up to recent times, we have only known three religious minorities in Turkey, uh, the Armenians, the Greeks, and the Jews. And this is in line with the fact that in Turkish, Azunluk means minority, but when we talk about minorities, we only talk, or let's say the Turkish Republic at least, the officials only talked about uh, the Armenians, the Greeks, and the Jews, as if only these three groups were recognized by the Treaty of Lausanne as Azunluk, as minorities. Um, if you read the treaty, you will find that in the treaty it is said, uh, minorite non musulman, non Muslim minorities, Musliman, Omian, Azunluklar. And Azunluklar is the plural and it means minorities. That is the first point. So it's good that we have this, uh, this opportunity to talk about the situation of religious minorities in Turkey and not only of the three minorities who for a certain time also were quite honored to be recognized as minorities and to present themselves as the only minorities. It's good that in a certain way even these minorities are forced uh, to come to an understanding that there are also un other minorities in Turkey who partly have the same problems and partly have different problems. A second point I want to raise is the fact that Europeans or Westerners in general, uh, and when I talk about Europeans I mean the people in the European Union, um, obviously like to get trapped. And they easily get trapped when they talk about the situation of minorities in Turkey. When the new foundations law was passed by the Turkish parliament, many people in the European parliament, and not only in the parliament, but all over uh, the European Union were very happy because, according to them, this was a step towards religious freedom in Turkey. To my understanding, the new foundations law and its regulations concerning the 
azınlık vakıflar, the cemaat vakıflar, the community foundations has nothing to do with religious freedom. It, it, it regulates the situation of these uh, foundations and it's good that there have been positive developments, positive steps, but in, in, the, in the basis, this has nothing to do with religious freedom because, and that is the main point, the Jemaat Vakufla, the community foundations have nothing to do with the churches as such. There are no legal contacts between the two spheres. On the one side, the community foundations, and on the other side, for example, the patriarchates and uh, the, bishop, uh, the bishoprics and the chief rabbinate in Istanbul. The trapping goes on. There has been a church service in Sumela Monastery in August. This has been widely applauded. There has been a church service in Aktamar, uh, in the Holy Cross Church. This was applauded widely. The federal president of Germany um, attended a church service in Tarsus. This was widely applauded. But these were singular events. Nobody knows when there will be the next church service in Sumela Monastery, when there will be the next church service in Aktamar, which was closed for public after this church service. Nobody can go there at the moment being. And uh, it's the same with the church in Tarsus. Now, obviously, Europeans, Westerners like to get trapped. Let's look to the facts. Most of them already have been mentioned by my colleagues. The fundamental problem, fundamental problem facing both the Christian churches, the Jewish communities, as well as all other non-Muslim communities, whether they already existed in Turkey before 1923 or only established themselves here in the recent past, is the lack of legal recognition of a legal personality. However, in this context, it must be emphasized that this problem is also shared by Islam in Turkey which is not that much known uh, outside Turkey. It is true that a quasi-state-sponsored Sunni Islam is supervised, organized, and promoted by the Presidency for Religious Affairs that is under the authority of the Prime Minister. In practice, however, the officially banned but still existing Islamic orders, the new Islamic movements, and also the vast minority of the Alevi, who are also affiliated with Islam, some say not, have been left just as much up in the air as the non-Muslim minorities. It appears that the idea of giving religious communities a such legal personality is regarded by the authorities, the courts, and most of the legal community as contrary to the principle of secularism, as laid down, down inter alia in Articles 2, 13, 14, and 24 of the Constitution. This, however, rests on a particular interpretation of these provisions as the Venice Commission of the Council of Europe has stated in its opinion on the legal status of religious communities in Turkey and the right of the Orthodox Patriarchate of Istanbul to use the adjective ecumenical published on 15th of March 2010. To the outside legal observer, there is nothing in the constitutional provisions that would explicitly prohibit a legislative reform providing legal personality to religious communities as such, as the Venice Commission rightly states. Let us just have a brief look on the issues and concerns of the religious minorities in Turkey. Doing so, we have to deal with the following groups. First, the non-Muslim minorities as defined by the Treaty of Lausanne. These are all non-Muslim minorities, as I mentioned already, present in Turkey before the signing of the Treaty of Lausanne, which took place on 24th of July 1923. These are, for example, the Armenians, the Bulgarians, the Chaldeans, the Georgians, the Greeks, the Jews, different Protestant groups present in nowadays Turkey since the 19th century, the Roman Catholics, the Serbs, the Syriacs, and others. Secondly, the non-Muslim minorities coming into existence in Turkey after the signing of the Treaty of Lausanne, that is after uh, 1923, these are, for example, the Baha'i, uh, the Evangelical Free Churches, and Jehovah's Witnesses. And thirdly, the Muslim minorities. These are mainly the Alevis, but also Shiite groups. What are the main issues of these groups? First, regarding the pre-Lausanne non-Muslim minorities. 
In breach of the meaning of the Treaty of Lausanne, the Republic of Turkey only recognizes the Armenians, the Bulgarians, the Greeks, and the Jews as non-Muslim minorities. The Bulgarians, uh, because of the uh, Treaty of Friendship of 1925. All other pre-Lausanne non-Muslim minorities are not recognized as such by the Republic of Turkey. Recognized doesn't mean legally recognized. That's another problem still. No one of the pre-Lausanne non-Muslim minorities has legal personality. Funny enough, the orphanage in Büyük Ada is owned by the Fener Patrikanesi. Uh, I don't understand that because uh, the Fener Patrikane or Ecumenical Patriarchate has no legal uh, personality and it owns in accordance with the rulings of the European uh, Court of Human Rights uh, uh, the uh, orphanage in Büyük Ada. It's good, but it's a quite strange case. The property of the pre-Lausanne non-Muslim minorities is not owned by the respective churches, but expect, except for the Roman Catholics and the pre-Lausanne Protestants by so-called community foundations. There exists no legal relations between the respective churches and synagogue communities on one side and the respective community foundations on the other side. There exists no Roman Catholic community foundations for a part of the properties of Roman Catholic religious orders and congregations. Land titles exist, astonishingly, but the respective land titles have no value as the respective religious orders have no legal personality. There are, however, two Roman Catholic religious orders who have been legally recognized by Turkish courts. Funny enough, arguing that these religious orders are recognized outside of Turkey and therefore, in accordance with international law, also have to be recognized in Turkey. Self-administration of the pre lausanne non-Muslim minorities is hampered by the fact that they have no legal personality. Legal transactions on behalf of the pre lausanne non-Muslim minorities are not possible. They can't even open a bank account. Training of clergy is not possible in Turkey. This is not only a problem for the ecumenical patriarchate, Halki, Mr. Baish will talk on it maybe, and the Armenian patriarchate, but also for example for the Syrian Orthodox community. Working and residence permits for foreign clergy and other personnel are normally not granted. I know that there are some ex exceptions, but uh, it's, this is also a quite tricky issue. <laughs> Secondly, regarding the post Lausanne non-Muslim minorities, the basic problem as regards the post Lausanne non-Muslim minorities is that they cannot register and obtain legal personality as such. Instead, they have to operate indirectly through foundations or associations, which probably also is contrary to the principle of secularism. Up to now, there have been no court cases against them, at least as far as that is concerned. A big issue for at least the evangelical free churches is the question whether it might be legally possible to use shops, apartments hired or bought as places of worship. In line with construction law number 3194 of 1985, places of worship can be erected with the assent of the civilian administration. Also, it remains to be clarified whether the term to erect refers only to the erection of, a new, pla of new places of worship or also to the conversion of existing premises into places of worship, worship which would be an answer to a central problem of the evangelical free churches. Thirdly, regarding the Muslim minorities. The basic problem as regards Muslim minorities, for example, the Alevis, is that they cannot register and obtain legal personality as such. A number of Alevi associations and foundations have been established so far, but to my knowledge, all of these entities at least officially have a cultural objective. The Alevi places of worship are called gem houses. They have not been recognized as such by the authorities and are not listed in the bylaws of construction law, of the construction law I already mentioned, listing mosques, churches, and synagogues as places of worship. A further problem for the Alevis, but not only for them, is education, religious education in schools. Despite the Alevi community's continuing objections to compulsory religious education at schools, which in fact is Sunni religious education, a proposal reflecting their demand to make mandatory religious courses optional was rejected. 
Alevis have taken their complaint to the European Court of Human Rights, which supported the right of Alevi children to attend school without being subject to religious education. The Republic of Turkey, however, has not yet obeyed to that court ruling. As a matter of fact, being forced to attend compulsory religious education is also a problem for the children of members of the Protestant free churches and other religious minority groups as long as they do not attend elite schools where they may hope on more understanding from the teacher's side. I thank you. Well, there is one question. Uh, could you explain what shifts you expect as a result of the recent referendum changing constitution, um, allowing charges of judiciary, etc.? What do you say? Well, let's say the Prime Minister, Mr. Erdogan, has announced that there will be a new um, constitution. Maybe the new constitution will give the answers to this question. Um, for the moment being, I don't see, uh, at least as far as the uh, topic of this conference is concerned, um, anything uh, that could be changed, uh, let's say, in accordance with what, with what uh, with was, has been, been decided by the referendum. Which we still have to wait for that new uh, constitution. Um, there has been a project uh, to introduce a new constitution already a few years back. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it has been put back to the drawers. Uh, so once again, we have to wait uh, for a new uh, constitution and hopefully uh, Turkey will make use of the expertise of people uh, from the Commission, from the Venice Commission and other experts outside the country. A second question is, isn't it more accurate to speak, or let's say a point, isn't it more accurate to speak about the problems of the religious minorities and uh, then religious majority in uh, Turkey uh, for the limitations uh, on Islam as well? Well, this most probably refers to the headscarf uh, uh, calf issue. Um, well, uh, let's say when we talk about religious freedom uh, at large, we also have to address this point, uh, that for sure. Uh, but uh, let's say, to my understanding, this is not the subject which should be raised or has to be raised during this conference. Uh, I would not agree with the saying of Mr. Oering saying uh, differ differentialize, differentializing the property issue with the religious freedom. I mean, these properties have been donated to the churches or to the temples or the synagogues for facilitating their services and their mission. So if you, the, our temples, churches, has no income, they cannot support the schools and the church expenses. That's why uh, this is not a way, I mean, it's a, not indirect, but a direct rela relation between religious freedom and the property issue. So this is also a basic right. But uh, for instance, the Catholic Church has no such a foundation, this traditional foundation that we have the other minorities, and they suffer with their properties. So that's why I, would believe, I, I will believe that it is a direct relationship between religious freedom and the foundation, foundations issue. Well, as a matter of fact, you are absolutely right. And uh, um, I don't remember that I have said something which, is, uh, which contradicts what you are saying now, uh, because I always have been of the opinion that, uh, let's say, the problems, the property problems of uh, non-Muslim minorities, specifically non-Muslim minorities, uh, but in that case, both those who have Jama'at Wakufla and those who don't have uh, such uh, Wakufs um, are related to religious freedom, that for sure. So, I realize that you said that when the new law for foundations passed from the, in Turkey yeah, that in Europe it was a misunderstanding related to the religious freedom and it's nothing to have, I mean, yeah. it's nothing related to religious yeah. freedom. The point I wanted to make is that, uh, let's say, uh, in discussion with uh, members of this parliament and also other parliaments, national parliaments in the European Union, uh, we got the impression and also the media transferred this impression uh, that, uh, let's say, the foundation's law was understood as the solution of the problems regarding religious freedom in Turkey. And that is not the case. 
<clears throat> yes, uh, just two more comments. There is no question about uh, these issues, but it's about the, the roots of religious uh, intolerance uh, in Turkey. It's sure that the media also play a role uh, in that uh, phenomenon. And I think, for example, of a well-known series, The Valley of uh, the Wolves, uh, that uh, induced uh, a number of uh, uh, perpetrators of uh, murders or uh, attempted murders, and they uh, avowed that, they uh, recognized that uh, during the uh, interrogation. And another uh, issue is the one of identity cards, where uh, you had a religious affiliation that was mentioned, and there was a court uh, decision in Strasbourg earlier this year uh, saying that uh, that box should be removed from the identity card. The reaction seems to be, well, uh, you're not obliged to fill in that box, but then you also become suspicious uh, if you don't fill in that box. It means that you uh, try to hide your religious uh, identity. You don't want to write to, to mention that you're Muslim, so it means that you're non-Muslim. And that can also be uh, a basis for some form of uh, discrimination or uh, negative attitude towards you. Thank you. Why are the Syrian Orthodox or the, yeah, the Syrian Orthodox in Turkey not recognized um, as a minority? Now, as I as I tried to explain, uh, let's say the Turkish government already always has uh, presented the situation of the minorities as if there were only three minorities existing in the country, plus the Bulgarians due to the Treaty of Friendship of 1925. Um, as a matter of fact, as I said. Uh, in the Treaty of Lausanne, it said, all it, uh, let's say, the Treaty of Lausanne speaks of non-Muslim minorities. So, to my understanding and to the understanding of most of the people present here, uh, the Syrian Orthodox and the Syrian Catholics are also minorities in the sense of the Treaty of Lausanne. Um, now, this is a political issue. Uh, it has, uh, well... Uh, that's the point. It's the will of the Turkish Republic uh, to present the situation as if there were only three uh, minorities. And uh, for a certain time, I would say, uh, even in the minorities community, now in the Lausanne minorities community, there was not a great interest um, to expand, let's say, the number of minorities. Uh, they were talking about themselves, the Greeks, the Armenians, and the Jews as the minorities. And when we were talking with them uh, about the fact that there are also other non-Muslim minorities, this was already a tricky issue. This has really changed uh, since uh, we started discussing uh, accession of Turkey to the European Union. Uh, further on, as you, uh, most of you will know, there also has been a working party installed by Mr. Erdogan, Turkish Prime Minister, to study the problems of the minorities. Um, they also uh, presented a minorities report um, four or five years back. Um, and uh, now, presumably, this minorities report uh, is lying in a drawer somewhere in Ankara. Uh, because uh, an infight started when it pre was presented. Uh, and further on, there was a lot of discussion, let's say, in the civil society in Turkey and outside the country, uh, but let's say, as a matter of fact, up to now, the other non-Muslim minorities have not been recognized, which always doesn't mean legally recognized, but have not been recognized as minorities, uh, besides the fact that they are named uh, non-Muslim minorities in this report. One more legal instrument that could uh, uh, protect in theory at least, uh, the, the minorities, any minority in Turkey beyond the laws and treaty uh, is the Convention uh, on the Protection of uh, National Minorities, the, the Council of Europe uh, Framework Convention. But neither France nor Belgium and other countries have uh, ratified uh, such uh, a document. But uh, certainly Turkey should do it. Yes, yeah, so just... I mean, there was one question for me, but I think it was more addressed for Mr. Herring. Why uh, should the uh, services uh, in the monasteries that have been allowed it should not happen again? I mean, everybody, of course, we, we hope it will, it will happen again. Uh, but as, a, uh, I mean, as a experience have shown, uh, promises and uh, nice, uh, nice, nice talk uh, might not be I mean, might not be sufficient, and uh, the question is really for even for the, so the seminary of Halki, you know, to have a permanent 
uh, opening and uh, authorization. Um, just occasional uh, freedom is not freedom. Occasional liberty is not liberty. And so the question is not uh, whether we do with TV and radio and media one time a year, once a year, a big event. The question is whether we allowed or not uh, the practice of the religion in the historical buildings. I mean, this is uh, what is about uh, the issue. And just concerning uh, a question raised about Islam uh, and the fact that there is also an issue of the freedom in Turkey for Islam, it's true. Uh, but I mean, uh, it's, it's true, it's not a debate today, but it is to some extent also still the question of how can uh, moderation, moderation in uh, religious field can be promoted um, through um, in the culture. Religious freedom cannot just be imposed by law. Religious freedom cannot just be imposed by courts or by the parliament or by reports. Religious freedom needs, as it has been said very nicely, truth and love. And it needs some kind of moderation between the society, inside the society. So the real issue is, on my side, what is really willing the government to do in order to promote understanding and real tolerance based on truth? Um, I mean, this is, this is a fundamental uh, aspect of the question we should, we should address. Thank you.